Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this OncLive Peer Exchange panel discussion on the topic of treating advanced gastroesophageal cancers. Gastroesophageal cancers remain difficult to treat, with most patients diagnosed in the later stages and only about half of those diagnosed with resectable tumors. In this OncLive Peer Exchange, a panel of experts in gastrointestinal oncology will provide practical information on classification and treatment of advanced gastroesophageal cancers. In addition, we'll explore the latest data on emerging therapies and where they will potentially fit into clinical practice. I am Dr. Johanna Bendel, and I am the Director of the GI Oncology Research Program and Associate Director of the Drug Development Unit at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Participating today in our distinguished panel are Dr. Ian Chow, who is a consultant medical oncologist of the gastrointestinal and lymphoma units at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London and Surrey. Dr. Yelena Jangjingian, Assistant Attending Physician of the Gastrointestinal Oncology Service at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. And Dr. Manish Shah, Director of the Gastrointestinal Oncology Program of the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. Thank you all for joining us and let's begin. So what an exciting time. We're here at ESMO 2016 and we're seeing more and more data and research and new treatment options for patients with gastroesophageal cancers. So I think it, it behooves all of us to go back and think a little bit more about, you know, what are these cancers? What are the differences in treatment of these cancers? How are they classified? What's the language around them? So I'm gonna start with Ian. So we hear about esophageal, we hear about gastroesophageal junctional cancers, we hear about gastric cancers. Are there differences between them? What can you tell us a little bit about the epidemiology of these cancers? So really for gastric cancer, um, the incidence of the gastric cancer actually has been falling ever since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and in most parts of the world, uh, that uh, particular disease is diminishing. But yet in, uh, uh, in Far East Asia, uh, China, Japan, Korea, that remains a very, very common disease. But in fact, it is actually the second most common uh, well, actually nowadays it's actually the third most common cause of cancer death, but if you add in uh, the esophageal cancer as well, that actually will push it up to the second most common cause of cancer death. Now for the esophagus, because they're in, there are two different uh, cell types, the squamous cell cancer as well as the adenocarcinoma. So where squamous cell cancer, again, are very common in many parts of the de uh, developing world. Um, and uh, is less so in the, uh, in the uh, Western world. Whereas for adenocarcinoma, which is mainly in the lower esophagus and the uh, esophageal gastric junction, that's actually rising um, in, in, the, in the Western world. There are many different, uh, different reasons that has been proposed. Uh, a lot of it is because of the reflux disease, and that might be related to, to obesity, which is becoming more and more common uh, in, 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 in Western world. Uh, so I think those are some of the uh, reasons why, uh, especially the, the um, adenocarcinoma of the lower esophagus and the esophageal junction is rising. So what do you think about Asia versus the U.S.? There's been a lot of discussion about people from Asia having potentially better prognosis for their gastroesophageal cancers. Yeah, so uh, I think part, there are many, many different reasons for it. I mean, part of it is because it is a very, very common disease in Asia. Uh, there are much more public awareness of it. So they do under, undergo endoscopy, whether you think it's a, it's a screening program. In fact, you know, like in Korea, they will actually start having endoscopy after their age 40, out of their own, uh, you know, their own wish. You don't actually, it's not like a national screening program. They automatically go to the hospital and because that is reimbursed. So they do find those tumors to be much uh, earlier and they do develop it when they're younger. Whereas in the Western world, it is less uh, common. It is not cost effective to do a screening program uh, in, in, in that situation. Uh, and therefore, uh, and it happens in, in older age group with more comorbidities. So I think it's multifactorial. It's not necessarily just a biology of the, um, of the disease, but actually the whole person with the comorbidities, uh, age and everything that actually uh, uh, will, will dictate the prognosis of, of our patients. 
Yeah, and we'll see some of the data where we see differentiating results or different results for patients from Asia versus the rest of the world. So it'll be yeah. an interesting concept to talk about soon. Manish, so all of these trials are happening. People are asking for seawort classifications, mm -hmm. Lauren classifications. How is a medical oncologist to keep this all straight and what does it actually mean? So um, I asked my friend, no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, CWIR classification, I, you know, I think um, as we're learning more about the potential differences of uh, esophagus and gastric cancer um, and how they're treated, particularly if it's a localized disease, um, the GE junction tumors that um, uh, exist, they've been subclassified into type 1, type 2, and type 3 um, G junction tumors as, as per the CWIRT classification. Um, and we, I, you know, for metastatic patients, we don't really think that that matters so much, but for patients with localized disease, as we'll talk about later, um, tumors that are CWIRT type 1 and often type 2 tend to be treated more of an esophageal paradigm which may include chemotherapy and radiation. Whereas here where type three tumors are really the gastric cardiac tumors, these tumors tend to be treated more of a gastric paradigm. Uh, so I think from a seaward standpoint, uh, it does make a, make a difference with regard to where you, the location is. And there may be biological differences as well um, with regard to uh, the genomic analyses that have been done. Um, and then with regard to diffuse and intestinal, um, that's also, I think, an evolving area. So um, intestinal type gastric cancers are much more prevalent in the epidemic areas. So in uh, Far East Asia or also in South America. Um, and uh, the biology is a, um, a transformation from dysplasia to metaplasia to cancer. And it takes uh, years and in chronic inflammation. Um, and diffuse gastric cancer is a little bit different. It, it actually um, has a relatively uniform um, epidemiology across the globe. About one per 100,000 people get diffuse gastric cancer. And the biological drivers of that may be different, like um, an ecadirin mutation and things like that. So right now, we still treat these cancers similarly. So in the metastatic and locally advanced setting, they still are uh, similarly treated. But I think, as we'll talk about later, some of the target therapies may be better suited for different subtypes of gastric cancer. So it's something to be aware about, um, but it, it doesn't impact practice right now.